This morning we'll be reading from Luke's Gospel, the 21st chapter, verses 5 through 19, found on page 1042 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Luke 21, verses 5 through 19. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. This is the gospel of our Lord. I think all of us are either terrified by descriptions of the end times from Scripture or we are immensely intrigued by the way Scripture describes this time yet future. Depending on where you fall into these categories will uh, will dictate how you felt when I was reading the words from this passage. Obviously, Jesus is talking about two events here, if you caught that. The first being what would happen to the temple in its surrounding structures in the not-so-distant future from when he was speaking to the disciples. And the second being what we may officially refer to the end times, that moment in time when God brings to the conclusion the order that has been in existence since sin tainted our order in the Garden of Eden. Indeed, this text is referring to these two future events, but according to the placement of Jesus' words in the context of Luke's gospel, Luke's focus is meant to draw our attention to another aspect of these future events. Chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel places us in the city of Jerusalem. The time of the Passover is drawing near, which means that the events of Holy Week, things like the Last Supper and the the triumphal entry of Jesus uh, into the Holy City have not yet happened, but soon will. So before Luke begins to describe these powerful events in Jesus' life, these events that are so meaningful to our own understanding of the faith, he first tells us about some of Jesus' encounters with the religious leaders of the day. Why does he do that? Well, when we say religious leaders, we're talking first and foremost about the scribes, about the Pharisees, who were the scholars and religious leaders, the experts of the day. And we're also talking about a group of people called the Sadducees, who were the more aristocratic and political group who had their hands both in the temple affairs as well as in the affairs of the government of Rome and especially how they deal with the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. The main issue at hand with these groups was to question Jesus' identity. Who are you? Or perhaps who do you think you are? They come to Jesus with challenges asking him things like, who gave you the authority to do the things that you're doing and say the things that you are saying? Of course, the implication is, it wasn't us. And if it wasn't us, then you have no authority to do these things because we are the ones who can bestow such authority. So Jesus handles their question with his own question. He says, John the Baptist, where did he get his authority? The scribes and the Pharisees were trapped by this question because no matter how they answered it, it would expose their, their own hypocrisy. Later on, the Sadducees would take a swipe at Jesus by trying to get him to say something that contradicted the teachings of the holy Moses, the famous Moses. And of course, the answer that Jesus gives them not only affirms the teaching of Moses, but brings to light their own bad theology 
the, the theology of the Sadducees who denied belief in the resurrection. Jesus demonstrated that the doctrine of the re- resurrection was actually something that Moses himself taught. So they are the ones who are in the wrong. And Luke tells us that Jesus so effectively exposed the Sadducees that they dared not question him again. They learned their lesson, and they won't challenge Jesus again. Then Jesus proclaims denouncement on the scribes, the theologians of the day, who loved being praised for their, we can say, degrees, their status in society. They loved being recognized for who they were, their abilities. They loved the praise of men. And by the way, all these interactions took place within the temple precincts, that, that outer structure with the temple in the background. There's one more incident that Luke mentions before getting into the discussion about the future. He mentions that while still in the temple, Jesus noticed how the rich men were not so discreetly casting their gifts, probably large gifts, into the temple treasury. No doubt so that all people could see how generously they were doing their giving, contributing to the work of God in their minds. But Jesus also notices someone else, a poor widow who certainly had very little to offer, also putting something into the treasury. According to the other gospel, she put in, put in two copper coins. Nothing, really. In fact, it was laughable, especially in light of how much the rich men were putting in, shoveling in, in the sight of men. And yet Jesus makes the remarkable statement when he says, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Wait a minute, she put in two copper coins. How's that possible? Well, Jesus gave us the answer. He says, all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, out of their abundance. But she gave out of her poverty and put in all she had to live on. She gave everything she had. Wow. In other words, she demonstrated a real and sacrificial trust in God. So if we put all these things together, Luke paints us a theme, I guess we could say, for which to, to, to use in order to, to, to understand what Jesus is going to say about the temple and about the time of the end. So what is this theme? Well, generally speaking, we can say that the theme is this. True faith in God is a matter of the heart. The Pharisees had outward religion but they had absolutely no desire whatsoever to concern themselves with the things that God concerns himself with. The scribes had their theological head knowledge. They knew a lot about God, but they failed to put that head knowledge into true faith. It was a disconnect between the head and the heart. The Sadducees thought they were faithfully representing the teachings of Moses, the the one that all Jews looked to. In fact, they misunderstood the core of his message altogether. The rich man who flaunted their wealth by giving large sums misunderstood what it truly meant to worship God. The poor widow, however, got it. She understood. She didn't have much in the way of financial gifts to give anything to the work of God, but what she did have, she willingly offered in an act of trust, in an act of faith, She demonstrated that her life is lived for God. That is the underlying message here, and that is the context of this portion of Luke 21. And in the background of all these interactions that Jesus is having, all these things that he is witnessing, is the temple. The center of Jewish religion and political life, there it is, large and beautiful. It's the place where people would come and meet with God. But the temple had become, well, it became something else. Jesus refers refers to it as as a den of thieves, believe it or not. It is not what it is supposed to be. It is not what it should be. And despite Jesus' efforts, it would not fulfill the role of being a house of prayer. That's what it was meant to be. And it was the center point for the Pharisees. It was the center point for the scribes, the Sadducees. It was the venue for showy religion where rich men could come and flaunt what they have so that they could get the praise of other people. It was everything but the house of God. With such a false understanding of the things of God, I think what we can say 
is that misplaced faith will lead to spiritual hopelessness. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. You can just about picture it in your mind, can't you? It was this massive structure built by none other than Herod the Great, the great man of faith, right? Yeah, he was a man of faith. He was a proud man. He was probably a small man and wanted to do great things in order to compensate. It was a massive structure. And it was still in the building process, actually, uh, of construction, and it would continue to be up until the 60s A.D., and it is said to have been adorned with, with gold plate on the walls and marble columns and, and 50 ton stones that were placed 30, 40, 50 feet in the air with, with such precision that they were placed that you could barely even fit a, a piece of paper in between the joints. Something that would be almost difficult to do with today's modern machinery. And yet they did it here all this time ago. This awe inspiring structure is truly, the people believed, a fitting place. For God to dwell. How magnificent. How wonderful. How breathtaking. But you see the problem with the structure like Herod's temple. Was that it was built. By human hands. No matter how beautiful it might have been. It was built with human hands. And in John's gospel. Jesus tells us about a place that is prepared for all those who trust in God. A place not built with human hands, eternal in the heavens. And in the case of the temple, it became something that was far removed from the purpose of worshiping God. Sure, there were priests. Sure, there were sacrifices being made. There were people who would come and bring their gifts and their offerings and their tithes. Everything looked good from the outside. Everything looked as though it's supposed to be a place of worship. But Jesus had already called out the problem with the temple. It might have had the appearance of a place of worship, but it was far from it. And the problem with the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, and the people who participated in this version of worship was that they were not worshiping God at all, even though they thought they were. They lived under a false belief that what they were doing was actually pleasing to God and and allowing them to draw near to God, but in fact it was pushing them farther away. Do you suppose that such a false understanding of worship, of church, of God, still happens today? Maybe in churches around this country? Maybe in churches around this world? Yeah, I think it does. Everything might appear to be just as it should be. They have everything in place that is supposed to make a church successful. Everybody knows what a successful church is supposed to look like, right? But the external facade is not what is important, is it? It's not what God desires. A church can have all the best of everything, but without an inward commitment to the, and, and devotion to the things of God, a church like that is nothing but a social club. It's nothing but a, a meeting place for like-minded people. For the people of Judah, the temple was everything. So you can imagine the horror when in talking about this magnificent and beautiful temple that people are just awe-inspired over, Jesus informs some of his disciples, as for what you see here, there will be a time when not one of these stones will be left upon the other. Every one of them is going to be torn down, thrown down, in fact. <laughs> what did he just say? How can that be? Thrown down? Who's going to throw down these 50-ton stones? This is a place where God dwells. What kind of power could produce such destruction? And more than that, what does the destruction of the temple mean in terms of our understanding of God? What do you suppose it would do to a person whose entire belief system is centered around this one physical focal point and to have Jesus tell you that this place is going to be turned into rubble? What would that do to your psyche? The center of Jewish life and religion is going to be destroyed. Jesus says. So what does that mean about people's understanding of life and religion? Because it just got shattered. And that has been the underlying message that Jesus had been declaring to the scribes and the Pharisees and to all who followed after this misunderstanding of of God and who he is and what he desires of his people. You might remember the story of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well in John's gospel. In order to avoid talking about the failures of her own life, because Jesus was sort of pressing her, 
She decides to engage Jesus in what we might call a theological discussion. Bad idea, by the way, to have a theological discussion with Jesus. The Samaritans, which she was, she says, worship God on Mount Gerizim, whereas the Jews worship God in the temple in Jerusalem. What does Jesus reveal to her with those words? He says, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, or in Jerusalem. The two centers of worship. And he continues, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. That is to say, worshiping God is not a building. It is not a place. It is not about priests or long robes or how much money a rich person can shovel into the offering plate in the sight of everybody else. That's not it. Worship is first and foremost a matter of the heart. It's a relationship where the love for God is played out through living life, pleasing God, trying to do what's right because we are his children and that's what we live for as his children. All we have to do is read through the, the teachings of Jesus to know what the heart of God is. It's not a mystery. Things like showing compassion for the poor and the needy or demonstrating kindness to a person who has been tossed aside by society. That's what God cares about. It's in the Gospel of Luke where we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. Where a man is in need, he's actually beaten by robbers, he's left, for half, uh, left half dead. We don't know if he's, how do you know if he's half dead without checking, right? Jesus tells us he was half dead, had a little life left in him. And yet there's the priest and the Levite and all the people who are, who are supposed to be or should be the, the people who are caring for this man. They, they see what he's, what's happened to him and they decide to pass by on the other side. They don't want to bother themselves with that. None of the religious elite shared this compassion and concern, the same thing that God would be concerned about for this man. Instead, they decided to see themselves as special. They don't want to be bothered with such things. And by the way, we don't know where this man came from. What nation is he from? Because we have, you know, natural enemies, right? But it was the Samaritan. The one man who was supposed to be considered the natural enemy of the Jews who stopped, showed this man compassion, bound his wounds, took him to the local inn, offered to pay for any other expenses that he might incur as he recovered. That's the heart of God. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what God cares about. The whole symbol of that false understanding of God was on display in the temple, and now Jesus has just pronounced its destruction. It's going away. And as shocking as this pronouncement must have been, the disciples come back with two natural questions, as you might expect. When will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Why would you want to know when something's about to take place, right? Unless you just want to get out, because that's what they wanted. They wanted to know so they could get out. But I think that highlights the whole point. If a person's faith is entirely based on something that can be brought to ruins, then that person's faith is placed in the wrong thing. What does it mean for them when the temple is gone? What does it mean to their understanding of God when the very place where God is believed to have dwelt is wiped off the map? What do they do with that information? I think such a thing would create a terrible crisis, an existential crisis for a person with such belief. In fact, their hope, their whole hope for the future is gone because it would be destroyed with the temple. Misplaced faith will lead to spiritual hopelessness. But Jesus' message is that God's presence is not limited by man-made structures or any limitations that we can put on him. Our hope is not built on a building or a series of mindless rituals that people just do in the name of religion. Our faith is in the living God, an active God whose heaven itself cannot contain him. As the psalmist says in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? I can't hide from you. You're everywhere. Where can I flee from your presence if I go up to the heavens? Well, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, well, you're there too. There's nowhere I can go to hide from you, God. 
And true faith recognizes that God is not bound by the man-made limitations that are placed on him, no matter what doctrines we might hold to. And for the person who has embraced that truth, what we can say is that living by faith brings peace even in the midst of chaos. Jesus is going to give some guidance concerning the two questions that the disciples have asked him. But the way he's going to do it is by first talking about the time of the end before he starts talking about the destruction of the temple. And by the way, that happened in 70 AD, which wasn't uh, maybe only a, a couple of decades after Jesus died and was resurrected. He, re- he said, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he, that is, I am the Messiah. And the time is near. The end is coming. Do not follow them, he says. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Again, Jesus is referring to the end times here and not to the destruction of the temple in this particular instance. When that time finally comes, however, some of the things to be aware of are false messiahs, false chronologies. Do not follow them or listen to them, Jesus advises in no uncertain terms. Don't listen to people who predict the day of the end, because they don't know. Coupled with this news is uh, other news of international conflicts, unrest around the world, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Well, that doesn't sound good. Sounds like things that should bring a great deal of worry to any person going through these very traumatic events, right? But did you catch what Jesus said right in the middle of these statements? Did you hear that? Do not be frightened. Why? How can he say that? Is that even possible, do you think, to not be frightened during such things? Well, we can ask that very same thing for our own times, can't we? Are you frightened by the things that you see happening in the world? But you see, that is precisely what Jesus is talking about. For people who do not have faith in God and do not live according to his word, yes, these things are very good reasons to be fearful. But not for the child of God. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Sounds great. Once again, these things would bring absolute terror and should bring absolute terror to people who do not know that God is in control because God is in control. And yet, just to let you know, I've already heard people say, well, did you hear about all the earthquakes that have been happening around the world lately? Did you hear about the food shortages in Europe? Do you know what Russia is doing to Ukraine and all the threats that uh, have been made in that little conflict? And of course, we have COVID-19 and all the variants and monkeypox, whatever that is. Wars, uprisings, earthquakes, famines, pestilences. Surely we must be living in the end times, right? Have you heard that? If that is the burning question that you're trying to answer, then I can say with absolute certainty that we're focusing on the wrong thing. We are. Jesus just told the disciples, don't listen to those who are trying to make predictions about the end times chronology. Don't do that. Did he say that because end times chronology isn't important? No. That's not the reason. He said that because whether the end times are near or yet future, there is something more important that the child of God should always be focused on, and that is complete trust in God, living for God, trying to build the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus can say, don't be frightened. You have nothing to fear. That is to say, I've now told you about this. You know it. You know what's going to happen. And you know that God is working through these things, no matter how bad they might appear to be. And because you know these things, you have no reason to fear. But now Jesus brings his listeners back to a much closer future, at least for them, when he says, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison. And some of you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. The previous stuff was hard enough, right? But now this? Was Jesus trying to be disheartening? Because I think some of the disciples might hear this and become disheartened. 
But again, this goes back to the kind of faith that a person has. Do they have a faith that believes wholeheartedly that God is sovereign and that he is in control of all things at all times? Because a person who does not have such a faith will not stand firm in the face of persecution. They just won't. Jesus says specifically that the persecution in store for the disciples is because of Jesus, not because of anything else, not because of political beliefs, not because of the hat you wear. You can't come in here with that hat. Not because of anything that you might believe, but because of Jesus and your dedication to Jesus. And for many people, getting rid of persecution by denying any devotion at all to Jesus is, a, is really going to be an, a, an obvious and unfortunately an easy choice. They'll get rid of it in a heartbeat. But for those who know and trust God completely, wars, disease, famine, persecution, and even imprisonment is not something to be feared. Do the disciples have a faith that trusted in God no matter what? And let me ask that same question. Do we have a faith in God that trusts him no matter what? If we do, then what Jesus says here should not be something that is hard for us to understand. Not something hard to employ. Despite whatever chaos might be going on in the world, we do not have to be afraid. We belong to God and there is nothing that can change that. We know that God is sovereign. He has a sovereign plan and there is no human power that can change that. And we live knowing that God has prepared an eternal future for us and there is nothing that can change that. It is set. And what that means is that we can live by faith in peace even in the midst of a world that is in chaos. So the disciples know about their coming persecution on account of being simply faithful to Jesus. They know, as do we, about the things that will happen in the world before the time of the end. We know about our eternal security that has been given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does Jesus tell us about what we are to do when things like that begin to happen to us? That brings us to our final point this morning. Our trust in God's sovereignty allows opportunities to witness in times of earthly crisis. Jesus says plainly in verse 13, and so you will bear testimony to me. In other words, times of trial and persecution are precisely the times when we are to stand firm for Jesus. When we tell other people about our faith and our trust and our devotion to God. And of course, you know, that's a, that's a hard subject for many people. Many people have an innate fear of talking to other people about matters of faith, don't they? A lot of people are terrified of that. And if that describes you this morning, then let me just say that Jesus puts your mind at ease in verse 14. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. That is to say, you will not have to worry about your lack of theological knowledge. You will not have to worry about a lack of oratory skills. That's That's not something you need to concern yourselves with. Why is that? For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to to resist or contradict. How about that? Jesus is going to give you what you need at that moment. How is he going to do that for the faithful? Well, I think we can couple this with Luke's other writing, the book of Acts, and say that Jesus will do this through the Holy Spirit who has taken up residence in each and every believer. Do you know that the power of God resides within you? Do you know that? Do you live in that knowledge of God's nearness? I was thinking about this, and I have concluded the easiest way to live as a Christian in this world. And I'm going to share that with you. Are you excited about that? Here's my conclusion. The easiest way for us to live as a Christian in this world is to do so without anybody else knowing about it. Isn't that true? You have faith, keep it to yourself. And don't tell anybody about it. How easy would it be to simply have faith in Jesus and not have to talk to people about it or demonstrate that faith to a world that is hostile to the faith? We don't want to do that, right? Unfortunately, I think many people have made that same conclusion long before I did. The true faith in Jesus is not something that can be hidden or contained or kept from the world. 
seeing Jesus in us. That's what we're called to do. Jesus' great commission is for the disciples to go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey, to observe everything that I have taught them. But the church has flipped that commission around, I think. Instead of going, what do we do? Yeah, we stay put. We simply wait for the unbelieving world to come to us. And in many cases, we kind of think the church is a little bit too churchy. So we decide to make the church a little bit more like the world that we're trying to save in order to make it more attractive for those unbelieving people to come in here. Other things that we do is we compromise what Jesus has taught us and we're supposed to teach others. Because some of the things that Jesus says is just too offensive to people who are unbelieving. They don't want to hear about sin. We want to make it less offensive, a little less off-putting. Water down the message so that people can feel comfortable when they come to church. Many theologians over the years have referred to this as the great omission instead of the great commission. And I think with, with good reason. The heart of the matter is that our faith is not meant to be locked away from the world. It's meant to be on full display for the world to see. From our earliest days in the church, we were taught, maybe with even flannel graphs, things like that, that we're not to hide our light under a bushel basket, because that defeats the whole point, doesn't it? That we are to let our lights shine before men so that they might see our good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. But the truth of our life of faith is not something that we will readily <coughs> share if we're not completely devoted to it. And we also understand that that is something that the world will not readily embrace. They don't care about your faith. They don't like your faith. In fact, they hate your faith. We saw how hostile even the supposed uh, religious leaders of the Jewish religion were to Jesus. In fact, his most heated encounters were with the religious people. If we're truly following after the Lord Jesus Christ in our own lives, then we can expect that same kind of treatment from the unbelieving world. Because we're pushing the wrong buttons. We're going against the grain. Even as Jesus t tells us here, we're going to go against people that are closest to us. You'll be betrayed by, even by parents, by brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Wow. That's pretty harsh. All of us are familiar with the language that we use here in the church to refer to each other. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not aunts and uncles. We're not grandfathers, grandparents, grandmother. We, those kinds of relationships don't exist. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And there's a good reason for that terminology. For us, our faith makes us part of the family of God. And as hard as it might be to understand, it means that our faith supersedes even our natural familial relationships. This verse gives us the reason why. People in your life, even people in your own family uh, unit who do not share your faith in Jesus may very well betray you because of your faith, according to Jesus, when pressed by the world around them. They don't want persecution either. And if they don't like your faith, and that's the reason why they might be experiencing persecution, you get thrown under the bus. But that should not be the case for those who share the faith as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are in it together. Some of you might have already had that sibling or maybe that family member who can't stand the message of Jesus. They don't even like it when you come around anymore because they just know that somehow you're going to be talking about Jesus. And in order to save their own skin or to avoid any kind of pressure from the unbelieving world, they might just hand you over. Everyone will hate you because of me. That's a, that's a pretty big statement, isn't it? Everyone will hate you because of Jesus? Do you have a faith that is prepared for that? Is your faith important enough for you to endure such treatment? I hope so. I hope so because once again, we are directed back to complete trust in God. 
We are not to fear in times of great distress in the world. We're not to fear when the heavens are shaken, when signs in the heavens are, are doing what God commands them to do. We are to stand firm even when we are placed under threat of persecution. And through all this, we are to witness to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because we know, we know what God has prepared for us. Jesus says in verse 18, but not a hair of your head will perish. Does that mean that no physical harm will ever come to those who have faith in God? No, nope, that's not what it means. Verse 16, I already mentioned that some of those people will actually be killed because of their faith in Jesus. So what does he mean? Quite frankly, it means that our faith is even more important than our physical lives. That's what it means. Let me ask you an important question this morning. Do you know what will happen to you when you die? Do you have the assurance of heaven because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because there's a whole lot of people who don't. If you know that Jesus has prepared a place for you, eternal in the heavens, a place not made by human hands, then even death itself is not something that we have to fear. We can live a fearless life. The Apostle Paul declares, oh, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where is your victory? For the believer, Jesus conquered death and was the firstborn of the, rec- uh, the resurrection so that his victory becomes our victory. We share in that victory. His resurrection is something that you and I get to take part in. We know that, but we don't really live that. And I think that's what Jesus is referring to here. The world might be able to hurt the body, but they cannot touch what God has sealed your soul. Jesus is not promising physical invincibility, but spiritual certainty for those who stand firm because they will win life. That's what's in store for them. As verse 19 says, with an assurance like that, we can live by faith and transform our trials into opportunities that bear witness for our Lord and the goodness that he has demonstrated in us. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, you might have heard the words of Jesus here and were terrified, or perhaps you were intrigued. So whatever the case, the underlying message here is that God is faithful. He is faithful always. Our hope is not placed in a a physical structure or in the things that we do for God in the name of, of religion. Our hope is based on what God has done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what that means is that we live with the confidence that God is sovereign. And in plain language, that is God is in control. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. His plan of redemption is being carried out even through the things in this world that we don't understand. That's what Jesus is saying here. But because of our faith in God, we don't have to fear the things of this world. Our task and our calling as disciples in Christ is to live by faith bearing witness to the salvation that we have been given in Jesus. We are to stand firm in all things because our faithfulness leads to everlasting life. Perhaps this is a hard message for those who are really only interested in what we might call easy believism. They only like all the good things associated with Jesus, but they don't really want to sign up for some of those more negative kinds of things. But just like the religious leaders of the day, sometimes the Lord has to put his finger on a truth that might get us to rethink things, to live differently, to reevaluate things if we truly want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Faith is easy. And whosoever shall come can get it. But faith is also hard because it requires losing our lives so that we may find life. How does your faith hold up when the trials and tribulations of this life are roaring towards you and when the world becomes hostile to the things of God? Can you stand firm? That's a question that all of us need to wrestle with and bring to God in prayer and humility, asking for God to give us an extra measure of faith. May God find us worthy seeing that we do not fear the world around us and that we stand firm bearing witness to the faith that we share. We follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, taking up our crosses daily, living 
only for him and trusting him completely. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the living and active word that you have given to us. A word that penetrates deep into our souls, into our hearts, changes us from the inside out and making us physical reflections of our Lord Jesus and the way that we live. We thank you for our faith. We ask for forgiveness for the times that we fail you, the times that we take our eyes off of Jesus and begin to fear the things that are around us. Help us, Lord, to have a complete trust, one that knows for certain that you are in control even through things that we don't understand. Because one thing that we can understand is that you have prepared a place for us and there is nothing that can change that. Help us to live by faith and not by sight, following in the footsteps of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask these things.